This lecture is on the cutting edge topic, applications of AI in radiation oncology. And we are really honored to have Dr. Lei Jing as a speaker today. Dr. Jing is the director of medical physics division. He's my boss. Um, uh, he's also a Jacob Hameson and Sarah Donaldson professor of medical physics. And he holds affiliate faculty positions in Department of Electrical Engineering, BioX, and Molecular Imaging Program at Stanford. Dr. Jane's research has been focused on artificial intelligence in medicine overall, medical imaging, treatment planning, image-guided interventions, nanomedicine, and applications of molecular imaging and radiation oncology. He's made unique and significant contributions to each of these areas, so we are very proud of him. Dr. Jing is an author of more than 550 publications. He is a co-inventor on many issued and pending patents and co-investigator or principal investigator on numerous uh, grants. Uh, he is a fellow of, of APM, ASTRO, and also American Institute for Medical and Biomedical Imaging. He is a recipient of Google Faculty Scholar Award. And in 2023, we are very proud of him when he walked on the podium at AAPM annual meeting to receive the prestigious Edith Quimby Award for Lifetime Achievement in Medical Physics so congratulations, Lei. We are very eager to hear your lecture on applications of AI in radiation oncology. I'll stop sharing. Ray, thank you so much, uh, Natalia, for the nice, kind introduction. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, obviously, nothing can be accomplished without you guys. Uh, uh, so I really appreciate uh, you know your support and uh, from the faculty uh, over the years. And all right, so I'm gonna talk about applications, artificial intelligence in uh, radiation oncology. So can you see the slide? Okay, right. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So, so AI is not a new topic anymore. I mean, I think. Uh, <laughs> the media, small, big, or even the self media uh, did have done uh, so much work. Uh, so I just want to uh, really highlight, uh, you know, it is interesting, both AI and, uh, and the modern radiation therapy has 70 years of history. Uh, you can see from this chart, uh, you know, when the AI, the concept of uh, was first brought up, uh, that was the year, uh, almost the year of the first linear accelerator in the Western Hemisphere uh, was installed at the Stanford Hospital. Uh, so obviously this LINAC is a, is, is a mark, uh, is a landmark uh, that uh, really marked the beginning of modern radiation therapy. And um, so over the years, you can see that there are a lot of progress in both fields. And uh, in the 70s, CTMR, in the 90s, uh, AMRT, and uh, of course, uh, in 2010s, so that's another 20 years after AMRT. So we were working on IGRT, right? Uh, image guidance, cone beam, onboard imaging. And then that's the, that's the time that uh, AI field start re reinventing or repopularizing the deep learning approach. Uh, it's all because of uh, a few key technical advancement uh, uh, in that field, like a back backpropagation, you know, image net, uh, data, big data sets, etc. So, two zero sixteen was a year of AI. <laughs> Uh, because that's actually the the first time that deep learning show up uh, in uh, AAPM annual meeting, uh, deep learning uh, for radiation therapy. And that's also the year actually alpha go, alpha go zero. You know, the computer agent beat first time uh, really, uh, you know, really uh, beat 
the international champion in the Go game, right? That's a very sophisticated uh, uh, game. Uh, yeah, there were actually there is a uh, documentary movie uh, on the YouTube. Uh, I really encourage you to uh, to watch it. Uh, it was actually quite a moment uh, when you know this Korean uh, Go uh, Go master. Ali Shidao was beaten by the by the machine. That was really a historical moment. Uh, it was recorded uh, at, uh, on the on, on the video, and and you can find it uh, on YouTube. Uh, uh. So of course, since two zero sixteen, almost the field is really going exponentially up, right? Um, both in terms of quality of the work. And a number of publications and the number of uh, uh, product that come out uh, from uh, this uh, this new uh, new emergence of the deep learning and you know so a lot of people that's why a lot of people think that uh, you know deep learning is it is an engine for this fourth industrial revolution so I I, I firmly believe so so in twenty twenty two. Uh, alpha go uh, alpha fold and alpha fold two so that is a uh, i mean to to me that is another landmark right so that was actually named uh number one breakthrough by science magazine uh because uh, you know being able to predict the protein structure uh using deep learning so that uh, and and that actually uh, reached to the Accuracy of over 85, 90 percent uh, accuracy. So that's quite phenomenal because that was actually a 50 years old scientific problem. When you when you're given a set of uh, amino acid, uh, you know, predict what kind of structure this protein uh, will form. Uh, so there is an international computation called the CAP CASP. Okay, and in the in the last twenty five years or so, it has been really the accuracy was around uh, uh, 45, 50 percent, and then all in a sudden with AI, we were able to push it to above eighty five, eighty eight. Uh, so of course, twenty twenty three is a big year for AI again. Uh, you know, ChatGPT foundation models. Um, or large language models. So that is really uh, making a hit. Uh, so everybody, uh, I, I'm sure, you know, the audience, uh, uh, most of you have used ChatGPT and uh, I'm also confident that you were amazed by how much this AI can do for, you know, human society. And, you know, of course, uh, on the medical physics, the radiation oncology side, we are also rapidly moving toward uh, data driven. Uh, so at uh, even at Stanford, you know, we have a biomedical physics program. We this quarter we actually have a class, a course for the graduate student. Uh, you know, just named uh, uh, data driven methods for uh, for biomedical physics. Right, um, and you can see that it is it is really going into our <laughs> our classroom our you know clinical application and also industry products uh, so just in a nutshell the big model uh the the so-called uh, uh foundation models uh so it's actually started i would say started at the google uh the bird model right that was a few years ago 2017 or 18 uh, this is, I would say, this is the beginning of uh, the foundation model. Uh, you know, it's get really get popularized, uh, and uh, and then uh, then you know, OpenAI obviously uh, really uh, push it to the commercial world, uh, and uh, ChatGPT three, ChatGPT not ChatGPT three point five and ChatGPT four point zero. So. So it's it looks like uh, you know the whole field it's it's really going up. Uh, I mean, I, I would 
I would not even say exponentially, even vertically, because there's just so many big companies are working, uh, try try to push uh, push the field forward. Um, so so ChatGPT ChatGPT four, you know the number of parameter has to reach to one point seven billion parameters, right? So think about it. Uh, so ChatGPT ChatGPT two and was on, on the on the and the three was was on the uh, billion and the hundred billion level. So now we are reaching to the one trillion uh, parameters. So it's a really a huge, huge model. Uh, and uh, yeah, there's a pretty picture was not only on the language side, right? This, uh, you can see that this is a teddy bear. This is actually generated by Dolly. Uh, you know, you just ask, generated picture, uh, a photo uh, for a teddy bear on the skateboard at Times Square. It will just come up with a scene. So, so, so you can see that we are really stepping out the language model. So this is just interaction between image, image and uh, and the language, right? Uh, and you, and also on the other side, you know, you can ask the computer to do auto annotation. So that's basically from. Uh, from image to language, so 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 this is uh, uh, whole field is really going forward. It has a, obviously you know auto annotation has a lot of uh, indication for medical application. Okay, uh, so in nutshell, uh, you know, this uh, foundation model they all based on the new architect, so called uh, transformer. Uh, Transformer neural network. Uh, so it's a, you know, obviously it's a language model. It's a uh, different from traditional uh, convolutional neural network, which is for imaging, image analysis, and uh, and it's very diff It's much more efficient than the multi-layer perceptron. Uh, that's on the other end, right? You have a every node connect to every other node, uh, but here. It's actually using the transformer, using a tension mechanism, to uh, to link uh, uh, to link all the nodes uh, efficiently, and uh, so that's why you know you can actually achieve uh, such amazing uh, performance. Uh, so we are. So this is you know what Archimedes claimed in. Uh, 20 year 20 20 uh, BC right yeah that's basically the golden time for physics physical science and I think now we are at the golden time of uh, data science uh, and big data uh, you know we can we can claim I could a similar claim that uh, you know if you gave me sufficient data and computation resource I can make all the decisions for you uh, I hope you agree with me. Uh, but, you know, I, I truly believe that this is happening and uh, this will get in better. So artificial intelligence has uh, three major aspects. You know, obviously there is a fundamental technology and application, right? So I think uh, all these three aspects are critical for the future of AI. Uh, uh, so on the fundamental side, you have uh, obviously computing, right? Uh, nothing will happen without a without a uh, powerful computing uh, framework, uh, GPU, TPU, right? And the cloud computing uh, is getting so uh, uh, also very uh, so powerful because we actually have some you know cloud computing based. Uh, uh, software that people can use, uh, you know, to see the deep neural network features. So we we, we created a, a cloud-based uh, platform. Uh, so I'll, I'll come back to that point later. Uh, but you know, it, it is on the cloud, uh, Google Cloud. Uh, and uh, quantum computing, it's 
on the horizon and big data, right? The, the data, when, when data getting bigger and there are a lot of problems, right? Uh, you know, how do you curate a large data set? Uh, how do you mine the data? And, uh, you know, if you ever done deep learning uh, research or application, you probably, you know, know that uh, a huge amount of time are being spent on big data curation. Uh, a lot of people say that uh, I spent 95% on data curation and labeling and 5% do the actual work. So which is a little bit exaggerating, but but not, not too much. So algorithm wise, uh, really we have a three three different type of algorithm, right? One is a supervised. Uh, so in which case you need a large amount of data, uh, data pair actually, right? You need a label, label data and also original data uh, so that you can train a model and do a prediction. And unsupervised, so in which case you don't need annotation, but you still need a lot of data. Uh, all semi-supervised learning. Uh, so, 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 so in which case, uh, a fraction of the data set has annotation, and the rest don't have right. And of course, you know, people work on reinforced learning, so which come from uh, the operational research people. Uh, you know, there were there are actually a, a large group of people from operational research who were working on. Uh, dynamic programming. So the reinforced learning, it's it really uh, try to uh, you know solve similar problem, uh, dynamic uh, or adaptive uh, optimization. Yeah. So so talking about algorithm and also the platform, right? Uh, I think uh, it is if you want to get started, uh, you have to decide what the what learning platform you want to, you know, you want to use Google or Microsoft or, or even, uh, even, you know, Facebook or Meta, right? So, so there are a lot, lot of uh, fundamental issue need to be resolved. Uh, uh, interpretability, you know, how do you trust the model that, the model prediction and also the fairness, right? Because uh, the model may just using the data that, that has a bad bias, and uh, so so those are the uh, you know practical issues that need to be resolved. And technology wise, uh, I think there's really uh, computer vision. It's that's where the deep learning convolution neural networks started. Uh, you know we have a classification problem and also regression problem. So there are actually you know different type of computer vision problem, right? One is classification. Uh, you want to really just let computer to classify the data, you know, into cat, dog, uh, et cetera. And uh, all the regression. Regression, basically your your variable is a continuum, continuous, right? You want to predict the patient's survival time, right? Uh, it's one year or it's two year. Uh, five years, so so it's a continuous variable that you are trying to predict, uh, and also the object detection. So that is, uh, you know, uh, that is another computer con con computer vision problem. Uh, language model NLP. Uh, so you try to understand the semantics uh, and you know translation, search engine. So those are the you know, on the NLP side, and of course the robotics, right, control. So which is a integration of uh, AI and also the the machine. So so uh, so that actually also include uh, you know machine and human inter uh, interface. So this is actually uh, I will say that uh, this is the ultimate of. Uh, of our, uh, <clears throat> the artificial intelligence uh, application, you know, on a on a broad 
picture, you know, you have a medicine, education, law, finance, yeah, um, pretty much uh, uh, every every field in in uh, in our society it's really geared toward uh, you know integrating uh, AI into into their field. Uh, uh, we do have a uh, two books uh, on AI in medicine and also in radiation oncology, biomedical physics. Uh, you can check it out uh, from Amazon if you're interested. So let's pause here and uh, have a quick uh, CME quest quiz. Uh, so the first question, deep learning can be divided into supervised, unsupervised, and semi-supervised. Which method require a large amount of uh, training data? So, so yeah, uh, we have three choices, and it uh, uh, should be an easy question. All right. And then let's go on. Uh, uh, you know, this is the second question. Uh, I mentioned the transformer, right? It is a new type of, okay. Oh, wow. Okay, so this is the choice, uh, you know, what, so transformer is a actually, uh, transformer, so the essential part is obviously, uh, uh, you know, it not only includes uh, local interaction, but also, you know, global interaction, because uh, it's really, the system trying to uh trying to learn from the interactive relationship between the input features. So so the the transformer that's why transformer it's it's in it's very powerful but also it's also very uh data hungry. All right. And the third question is uh how many parameters are involved uh, in recent foundation model, like a chat GPT-4, right? Uh, or chat GPT-3. So you can, yeah, it, it is a huge number. Uh, I just want to, want to get, get some feeling uh, how big the model has reached. Uh, so, so FDA has, approved uh, many AI products. So in 2020, uh, which is only three years ago, uh, we had uh, about 30 products. And you can see that these are the least of the product. Uh, and uh, majority, the majority of them actually are focused on radiology, imaging related, right? CT imaging, ultrasound, you know, echo, cardiogram analysis, etc. So, but so as of early this year, we had more than 520 uh, products approved by the by the FDA. Uh, you, you can see that the growth rate is a, is a huge. And actually last month, I, I watched the number is really reaching 600. So so it's a lot, lot of AI product uh, uh, in uh, in medical field are being developed and approved uh, by FDA and and uh, so the market of AI in twenty thirty it, it's estimated to be around uh, hundred billion. Okay, uh, if you are in the business world, maybe you should catch this wave. You know. Uh, so we call it a rising market, right? Uh, but you know, 100 billion, it sounds like a lot, but if you compare with the general AI market, this is actually, you know, not a, not a even close to, this is only like a tenth or maybe 5% of the overall market. I mean, just think about the open AI today, the, the market value is about uh, $80 billion already, okay? 
so so you can see that the uh, so the medical yet 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 the uh, commercial wise uh, it it is a uh, it is big but it's a uh, it's a uh, it's not huge uh, compared to the entire AI market. Uh, so the so the projection for AI in twenty thirty for the entire AI field is about the about the two billion. Okay. It, so if you remember I mentioned that the, the Chat GPT four has a parameter 1.7 billion, right? Uh, 1. Uh, 1. 1.7 trillion. Uh, so it's almost like one dollar, <laughs> one parameter at this we are at that stage. So so it goes it it's it it's a uh it goes like uh you know uh, when when obviously when the model getting bigger uh you know the price per parameter getting smaller so all right uh so let's just talk about the application of ai in radiation oncology so this is a slide that i created uh, back to 2017 i gave a talk at the aapm and you know there was a there was a uh, audience ask me what AI can do for radiation oncology. Well, I said that you know everything, <laughs> everything we are doing now will will have some component uh, uh, from from AI. So from imaging, right on the imaging side, uh, you know, I think that the future of the imaging device will be simplified or the performance will be enhanced uh, or both. Uh, so I'll, I'll give you some example. Uh, and then of course, modeling segmentation, right? It's already in the clinic. Uh, many, many commercial companies already have a, a deep learning based product uh, and treatment planning automation uh, really gonna uh, Enhance the efficiency, and uh, and also, I would say that improves the quality, and because, you know, uh, because AI has a standardization, so overall you improving the quality and 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 reduce the the effect uh, the cost effectiveness, right? Because uh, uh, right now, you know, if you have a each treatment plan costs roughly about uh, six hundred dollars. Uh, that's that's basically uh, those those symmetries company charge uh, if you ask them to do a, to do a treatment plan. So six hundred six hundred dollars. And think about Stanford has a treat over three thousand patients each year. So that's a lot of money, uh, a lot of cost, right? So if we can reduce that, uh, obviously that would be a big benefit uh, uh, to the society and then to the patient ultimately. Uh, so image guided delivery, right? Because uh, nowadays you don't get any Linux without, without image guidance system, right? either onboard CT or onboard MR or, you know, uh, stereoscopic uh, X-ray. So you want to into so those need AI to really uh, you know extract the information and then uh, align the beam to the target uh, and then of course uh, you know even provide feedback to the mission patient follow up prognosis right so uh, and also uh, just predict the toxicity predict the uh, the survival. So every so, so you can see that in this entire uh, workflow, you know AI will will play a significant role. I didn't even mention you know things like a QA, right? Because a lot of people working uh, using uh, deep learning to to really uh, do a sparse measurement uh, so that uh, and then to get the whole picture of. Uh, of a, a dose distribution that to be delivered to the patient. And so imaging, segmentation. So, 
So not only the normal organ, but also the tumor target segmentation. Uh, so that, you know, we, this is tradition. This is obviously uh, uh, the work uh, uh, done by British oncologists. Uh, so I think there are a lot of work a lot of progress has been made uh, along the line uh, using AI to identify the tumor and also uh, delineate the tumor, okay? Uh, so treatment planning, yeah, uh, I'll uh, give you some example and then image guidance and the predictions. Uh, so, so predictive model and so this is, uh, so, AI in red onc or in medicine in general, it's a very, very challenging task, right? Uh, I think we are, we only really touch the edge of this whole, uh, the whole AI in medicine problem. Uh, so a lot of challenge. I mean, I think the, the biggest challenge is uh, obviously we have so many right now, uh, we are in the age, we, you know, we are not in the age of uh, general AI, right? So general AI, it's basically um, it's a computer agent can think can, like a human. Uh, so that's what we call the general AI, it can behave like a human, et cetera, you have know, robots. Uh, uh, but we are really just building a model that for a specific task, right? So. It, so because of that, you know, think about how many diseases a human being uh, have. So anybody, I should put it as a, maybe a CME credit uh, question. So I think uh, uh, there are about uh, over 30,000 different diseases okay, in human being. And then of course, think about each disease has a subtype, you know, have a this, this different stage, and you're gonna build a deep learning model for each one of this. And that will be, the challenge will be staggering. And also the data, right? I mentioned this briefly already. Uh, you know, we not only need a huge amount of data uh, for training the model, uh, I mean, by huge, I mean, you're talking about million or even 10 million, right? In the the first the first paper, uh, a clinical study of a skin cancer paper that published in 2017 by Stanford group uh, uh, that was published in Nature. So they used 13 million like uh, a dermoscope image Okay, 13 million, and that's the that's the number we are talking about, and annotated. <laughs> so, uh, and and not you know when you go really deeper, you know, not only the number, it is uh, challenging, but also the modality, right? You have a different modality, you have a image, you have a video, right? This is actually a cystoscope image uh, uh, taken by. My colleague Joe Liao, uh, who is a urologist. Uh, uh, so in here, our task is really use deep learning to identify the bladder tumor, uh, high risk region, so that you know, in the OR room or in uh, during the procedure, they can they can see them. At, you know, you you don't have a false negative. Uh, uh, so this is, and then of course the genomic data, right? And so those are, uh, we call the high dimensional data, and not only genomic, but also other omics data, right? Protein omics uh, and uh, in the biology world, uh, you know, people start talking about the spatial transcriptomics uh, and that yet, you know, you're not only sequencing the single cell, but you're also, you know, getting the spatial location of each, each, uh, each cell. So that, actually also increase the size uh, of the your data tremendously. And not to mention that, you know, this data are oftentimes are very noisy and, you know, missing the data, right? So so you can see that uh, uh, 
it's a major challenge now, especially with a big model, like a foundation model. I think it's really where you get those data uh, to train your foundation model, right? So foundation model, we mentioned that, uh, and uh, of course, if you really look forward and, and then, you know, so this is a uh, image foundation model uh, re, uh, released by Meta, right? So they actually trained a, uh, a not a language model, but image image segmentation model, uh, use the image net and many other uh, image database. So, so, so you can actually uh, take the foundation model and then do some fine tuning. So the way you do fine tuning today, uh, or as the way that we do it, is you know we throw some part of the parameter and then fine tune other part of the model. Obviously, this is a very empirical process, right? Because uh, you you have to decide which part you freeze, which part you tune. And, uh, but yeah, we, uh, I'm not going to go to the technical detail, but, but this is how we do it today. But beyond the foundation model, obviously there's a multi-modality model, right? Uh, so you want to have a super, super foundation model that take uh, all the data in different format, text, image, speech, and uh, you name it, uh, and then genomics data, et cetera. Uh, not only the modality, but the thing, also think about uh, the scale, right? You can take the data from uh, genomics, like a gene level to cellular level to protein, and then to pathology level and to you know medical imaging level. So these are just multiple scale uh, information that you can actually uh, uh, integrate them into a into a big model, and then that will do basically all the clinical clinical work for us. Uh, so make uh, all the clinical decisions. So so that's the big picture of, for the future AI medicine. All right, but let's see how how do we do? Uh, yeah, we have twenty minutes. I just want to talk about some specific application. Uh, before that, I want to also, you know, give you some idea what is that deep learning, right? Because uh, to a certain extent, everybody know deep learning is a, it is realized by using a deep neural network. Uh, this neural network function like a mapping, right? Mathematical mapping. You have a input data that goes through a, Nonlinear transformation, you get the output, right? So, x to y, uh, nothing more than that. Uh, so, x is generally actually is a we call it a high dimensional vector. Okay. Uh, so, what do I mean here? If I gave you an image, let's say hundred pixel by hundred pixel, and you have a vector of ten thousand dimension. Okay. And your output can be anything, right? Uh, it can be uh, another image, right? If you want to restore a image, or you want to really go from a low resolution image, let's say, to a high resolution image. So, so this is the first type of application uh, we call, you know, X and Y are in the same data domain. Uh, so recently, one of my uh, research scientists, uh, Tawhid Islam, done some really nice work. Uh, so what what he were able to do is really come up a mathematical description of this mapping process from a x to y. So so in his work, he think that you know each input data is a high dimensional vector, right? Uh, it's a one point in the high dimension. And uh, you know, if you have a 10,000, let's see, input data, so you have a 
10,000 data point. And this 10,000 data point actually form a, a, uh, a surface it's called it's called a manifold input data manifold right it's really just a high dimensional surface uh and then that goes through you know layers and layers of extraction so this is inside the neural network so each neural each each layer you're actually really just deforming this this uh, high, uh this manifold and then and then reaching to the output, that's another manifold, okay? Uh, think about just a surface deformation in a high dimension, right? Uh, so that's what neural network is doing mathematically. And uh, I just gave you some example, right? Uh, so denoise, so if you have an image that has noise, you want to denoise it, or you know, if you want to do a synthetic image from CT to MR or MR to CT. So that just it is another question. You really just transforming one high dimensional data to another high dimensional data, right? Super resolution, that's uh, from low resolution image to high resolution. And even the RT dose calculation. So I'll give you some examples. So this is example, uh, to, dual energy CT, you normally you would have to buy an expensive scanner, uh, actually uh, uh, with a, you know, Siemens has a two actually tube, one running at a high energy, one running at low energy. And then you take two CT scan and you do a reconstruction, you get the dual energy CT, right? But with a deep learning, you can, what you can do is you actually can just use a single X-ray tube and then just run it at, just use a single energy CT scanner, you can really map the low energy CT to high energy, or vice versa, right? So, so this is just another example that two of uh, our postdoc, uh, you know, really uh, uh, in pathology, in, I think uh, the state of art you know, in, in standard practice, it's, you know, still the HNE, but, uh, you know, there are a lot of uh, functional imaging study, right? Uh, you actually uh, use anti antibody to label uh, and then to see the distribution of certain type of cells uh, in, the, in, the, in the tissue slice. Uh, you know, for instance, you want to see the immuno cell, right? What is the distribution of uh, immuno cell in, in the tumor tissue? So, so this so-called a functional image, functional uh, staining, uh, is very promising but very expensive, uh, uh, very time-consuming too. You have to wait forty-eight hours, spend about uh, three thousand dollars in order to really get a functional staining for one and antibody. Right. So, so with deep learning, you can actually simply just map from either a regular HNE or even just microscope image to get the functional staining uh, inf information. So this is a study that ongoing. And then those calculation, right? You can uh, you can get the uh, Monte Carlo quality dose distribution just by using either a pencil beam or even retracing uh, you do a ray tracing or do a, a regular pencil beam, you can map that information to a high quality uh, dose distribution. And, you know, and also very fast. So this is the work done by one of the postdoc, Oscar. Uh, you can actually get the dose calculation, high quality dose distribution within less than a second, okay? Well, think about it. Uh, in a second, you can get like a Monte Carlo quality dose distribution uh, per beam. So that that's uh, you know really uh, incredible. And so this just so he did a lot of validation work. Uh, uh, you can go to the paper to 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 find the detail if you want. Uh, and segmentation, and this is uh, the work done by uh, Eugene. 
uh, Jay Shijun and and also with uh, Quinn. This is actually was a Quinn's patient. Uh, so you can see that uh, th this is actually a real patient. Uh, you know, using our in-house uh, segmentation tool that uh, we can we can segment the patient. So, I mean, this is really come to the to the question: How do you deploy? your AI into the clinical practice. You know, this is where I feel that we need real human intelligence because dealing with with different different people, different uh uh different administrative uh component inside the hospital uh you know get get, get things done. Uh, it's not it's not uh, something that AI can do. Uh, you you really need Need a lot of work. I need a lot of uh, human intelligence to make it happen. And treatment planning, right? Automation. You can actually uh, just input your patient CT and uh, segmentation, uh, and then you know let AI to to predict what is the dose distribution. So. So another application is, uh, you know, when the X and Y are in different data domain. So what do I mean here? Uh, you know, if you're doing imagery construction, so your input data is actually measurement, right? It's either a sonogram or case-based data in the case of MR, and then your output is a image. So so they are in a different different domain. Uh, so for this type of application, it's also a manifold mapping pro, uh, process. It's a it's actually a regression process, but you know this is a CT reconstruction process. You need take currently you need to take about over eight hundred projection from zero to three hundred sixty degree, and then you you convert that into a into an image, right? So. So deep, the problem here is, uh, you know, with the conventional imagery construction, you know, the prior knowledge are not not being used, right? Because every patient come in as a new, as a new patient, you just start from the beginning, you take a measurement, you do the reconstruction, you done. But the prior patient data are not even a part of this reconstruction process. So, so data driven is really try to you know benefit from not only the current patient measurement but also the data uh, from previous patients. Right, we we image many millions and millions of patients. So those data should not should not you know, throw away uh, and should be actually utilized to benefit the new patient. And this is a, a uh, relative old work, but uh, you can you get some taste. Uh, so with the data driven, right, uh, you can actually significantly reduce the number of uh, number of uh, measurement. So here we can actually uh, reduce make a volumetric image with a single projection, okay? So I remember in the conventional CT image, you have to take care of, uh, you have to take more than 800 or even 1,000 projections. So now we reduce that by three order of magnitude. Okay. Uh, and then the work, the same thing for MRI, you can actually, uh, uh, do a very sparse MR image uh, by using uh, by using a data driven and and this is I think the physicists would love this. Uh, uh, so here, what uh, Jeremy did is you can take a very sparse dose measurement and then use those information and uh, deep learning to get the three D dose distribution. So. Uh, so the principle is very similar to the imaging, uh, but you know, uh, obviously this is photosymmetry. You can see that the, the predicted dose 
inside the patient and uh, the measured dose actually are, now this is a phantom, measured dose are almost indistinguishable. Okay. Uh, for biological data processing, and this is actually a, you know, a work by Dr. Islam, uh, you can, what, what he can do is use the deep learning to process the uh, genomics data, single cell sequencing data. Uh, so the single cell sequencing, let's see. Uh, yeah, let's, let's just, so in nutshell, what he can do is he can convert the sequencing data into a uh, image he called uh, a genome map and different type of cell actually, uh, you know, have a different genome map. And then you can see that these are different type of epithelial cell. Uh, they are very different. Uh, and then he can apply the convolution neural network to classify the cell. Actually, you know, after the image reconstruction, you don't you don't really need a deep learning to tell you know there are different type of cells, right? So 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 this is uh, this is the power of uh, imaging physics. So you have to you know convert the gene sequencing data into an image and then apply the deep learning, and so he can actually get uh, almost like twenty percent more accurate result as compared to uh, the conventional approach. I think my time is up. Uh, I want to really uh, leave a few minutes for questions. Uh, but you know, the third application is the input and output. They're not even the same type of data, right? They just have some causal uh, relationship, uh, like a clinical trial, right? You, you have a treatment modality you want to predict what is the outcome? You know, is the patient gonna survive five years or or ten years? So, or what type of toxicity? So, so those are we call the causal relationship. It's you know, it's uh, so using deep learning you can also do that. Uh, and this is a AI for immunotherapy prediction. Right? Immunotherapy is a magic magic therapy, you know, uh, but it only work for what 20 to 50% of the patient. So how do you really tell the patient uh, at before the actual treatment? So it, uh, so this is actually a, a work that we have done uh, using deep learning to really stratify the patient uh, who will be the responder, who will not. And so, uh, obviously, the clinical significance is is a huge. Uh, I think I'm gonna stop here and then let people to ask some questions. Uh, all right. Uh, yeah. So this is uh, this is what uh, I talked about. Uh, you know, I talk about deep learning, big foundation model, and then what are the challenge. Uh, yeah, I didn't spend too much time and talk about deployment, uh, other than just saying that it is uh, it is quite challenging, really. Uh, you know, from multiple aspects, and then and talk about different applications: uh, imaging, treatment planning, uh, precision medicine, just like the therapeutic response, etc. I want to acknowledge my colleague and. Uh, lab members uh, so we it's our teamwork <laughs> sometimes work sometimes don't but we try thank you thank you lay excellent talk thank you so much uh, so we're gonna open the floor for questions while people are getting to the mic um i would like to ask a question futuristic question so okay. I'm just wondering how you imagine radiation oncology in, let's say, 20, 30 years? That's a great question. <laughs> yeah, that's a question actually I've been uh, really thinking. I think if I will, you know, you will see basically a much smoother workflow, right? Uh, so. So, uh, 
So basically, patient come in, take take a CT scan, and there might be a you know robots running the scanner. <laughs> so and the scanner will be much simpler. It's not you don't have to you don't have to worry about the computer throughout from the scanner. <laughs> that kind of uh, uh, it will be much simpler uh, design because with uh, AI deep learning and uh, it's so. So because it is simple, so you know, it, it takes much less to maintain to really support, and uh, and you will see, you know, a few radiation colleges, but not many. I mean, really, just I would say that uh, it will be a really computerized department. That's actually a, a you know, with a seamlessly integrated workflow. So so you don't have to go through step like simulation and then, you know, coming up with a with a immobilization and then, you know, do all the... So there's just really a lot of manual treatment planning. So everything after CT scan done, you know, everything is already there, right? Treatment plan is there. Mm -hmm. Segmentation, not to mention that it's there. And uh, physician just need to really double check it and, and then push the button and the patient gonna be uh, gonna be treated obviously in the same day. <laughs> uh, they don't have to come back again. So yeah, I, I think I think a lot of things gonna be changed uh, down the road. Then. Do you think new machines can be designed with AI? Uh, well, definitely, yeah. I think. Uh, uh, Using using AI to design some new machines and with a lot of integration of uh, AI for sure, uh, that's definitely the trend. Right, AI design AI. Uh, yeah, I think I think uh, it, the machine will be much simpler. Uh, today, yeah, you you know the very really tried so hard to really speed up the gantry rotation right from one minute to whatever they are now. Uh, but you know, but in the future you, you take an image, you probably don't need the rotation. <laughs> you don't so that would be everything will be real time. And think about it, right? Real time MRI, real time CT and uh sub second treatment. Yeah. <laughs> so things awesome. are changing. Okay. Yeah. We see some question from the chat, right? Uh Maxim, you wanted to ask a question? Yeah, I want to ask a couple of questions. First of all, thank you for presentation. And my first question, these models are really nice, but to which extent medical doctors in your center use them? Because to my mind, it's a problem that we develop models, but medical uh -huh. doctors don't find them useful. Well, that's a that's a, it's a good good question. Yeah, obviously, uh, you know, the that come to the deployment, right? You have to, I mean, not a, not a every model will be useful or will be used uh, by the physicians, uh, uh, which is understandable. I mean, a lot, but uh, uh, you know, the segmentation model, right? So that one was used uh, uh, for, I think uh, more than 50 patients and and uh, that was used, uh, you know, it did bring, uh, even now, we, I think Shijin had a, a brain meds segmentation, so that actually uh, detect and then segment uh, the tumor volume. Uh, and then that is being used. And then, you know, I, I feel that our clinic it become, you know, the tool is really become indis indispensable. Uh, you know, the clinician really rely on on those tools to to really uh get our clinical work done. I, it is a uh, interesting to see how you know people's happy to get changed. Uh, uh, but we do see that in the clinic. Uh, you know, if you have some some tools that is really useful, yeah, you know, the physician or the dosimetrist. Uh, uh, physicists will use it, right? Because that save time and then improve the quality. Uh, but you know, a lot of model, I would say that that come from, let's see, 
a, a computer vision person who has no clue how, how clinic works and that is unlikely to, to fly in the clinic, right? Uh, so, so yeah, I think, I think uh, that's where the human interaction, you know, it's becoming incredibly important. Uh, so, yeah, you you do see you do see a lot of tools actually being used. But um, but then you know if you ask uh, my colleague Kurt Langlatz, uh, he did a statistical study. I think he was saying like uh, only three percent of all the models uh, get really even truly you know, get to the clinic, uh, which, which is, which is okay. I mean, I mean I, you know, not everyone, not every model going to be used in the clinic, right? But, uh, you know, if students yeah. learn something new and that's, that's a useful model, right? So. Yeah, I have a couple of following questions, if it's fine. Uh, first of all, you mentioned the model bring meds. Is it for metastasis segmentation? And yeah. I never heard about this model. Yeah, it... I didn't talk about it. Uh, that's a work done by uh, one of our faculty, Shu Jin Gu. So that one actually, uh, you know, uh, our cybernetic physicians, uh, they use it routinely. Uh, Is it yeah, publicly I... available? It's not publicly available, <laughs> unfortunately, yeah. Are you patenting uh, it? Is she patenting? I don't, I don't think there's anything to patent there. We can talk okay. to Shu Jin. But the, the thing is, obviously, there's liability issue, et cetera. So, but yeah. in house, yeah, it's being used because you, you know, you use it, but you have to double check, right? Because, uh, yeah. uh, right. It, it is, yeah. Uh, you know, there, there are some uh, other companies. I know there is a company in Boston. They also really selling their software to for brain meds segmentation. Uh, but, you know, it, one last question. Yeah. Are you willing to make it public? Because uh, at uh, <laughs> University Hospital Zurich, we are now doing segmentation for metastasis. And yeah. I'm pretty sure we'll be happy to have a collaboration regarding the automatic segmentation for metastasis. We can follow. I need to uh, talk to you and see how to. Yeah, I mean, we'll, I mean, in general, we'd, we'd love to collaborate. Uh, May I write you an email? Sure, yeah, write me email, I'll connect you with uh, Xu Jin and see how to uh, how, how to proceed, right, obviously. Uh, we we also made the CSI, auto segmentation and auto planning. Yeah. Um, and that's publicly uh, available now, so people can download auto planning mm -hmm. and auto segmentation. Great, thank you. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Any other questions from the audience? Oh, let's see. There is a one I'm a AI assistant helping <laughs> very wrong take a note for this meeting following. It's just the AI oh, assistant. Yeah, see, see in your in your talk there are AI assistants as well. Oh nice. Wow. Yeah. Taking notes. Yeah. I mean uh, I think uh, you know transcription, you know, all those work uh, can be done. Uh, by, by the AI, by language model. And then yeah. we will translate this lecture into Ukrainian using AI as well. <laughs> That'd be great. I'd love to hear that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> awesome. Few, uh, Ukraine. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Leigh. It was excellent thank lecture. Thank you, everyone. Bye -bye. See you Friday.